featured in a variety of exhibitions, including the Venice Biennial, Shenzhen Biennial, and Dubai Next, and the Vitra Design Museum. And she was visiting professor of visual culture studies at the Technical University of Delft. Uh, has published widely, and I'd like to welcome tonight Charlie Colas. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with my first image, which is also my only image, um, which was a challenge set to me by you guys, which was a really fun challenge, actually, because usually I show hundreds of images. Um, this is a picture of Dubai. Um, it's a picture of uh, Jumeirah Beach in Dubai. And um, that um, and this was taken, I, I, taken by me in 2006, and it was um, for an exhibition that I did um, called Dubai Next, which was um, shown in the D uh, Vitra Design Museum in 2008. And what it was, was it was a commission, um, part of a commission by the Dubai um, government, essentially. And um, what they wanted to do was they wanted to show um, Dubai's rich cultural tapestry. So it's multiculturalism. It's, it's multi um, multicultural kind of nature which had been eclipsed by the um, propaganda that had happened in the Western media against um, Dubai, um, which had kind of appeared almost um, spontaneously, had sprung out the desert, um, became incredibly wealthy, um, became one of these major um, hubs through which the um, global market economy and global capitalism um, was able to function. Um, and in order to do this, in order to um, um, match its um, development um, with um, people power, it invited um, participation from outsiders to such an extent that um, foreigners outnumbered native, natives by nine to one. Um, but because they invited so many people in, um, didn't give them any citizenship or rights to um, citizenship, um, they became under attack, um, uh, mainly because of their human rights abuses and um, there was a lot of talk about um, l labor exploitation and everything. Anyway, so what happened is that the Dubai, Dubai government wanted to show how um, people were living side by side, an enormous number of people were living side by side and how the landscape of Dubai that was um, um, critical for being all about wealth and, um, and and whiteness was actually um, very rich. But what, they, what we showed is that actually what was happening in Dubai is that there were many people living um, in one city but all separated, so in different areas. So the Irish and the Americans went to Irish and American pubs. You know, the Indian um, workers went to Indian restaurants. No, no one actually met. And so this is um, an example where um, people actually meet. Um, so anyway, um, so what I would say something a little bit about myself and why I was invited to um, participate is in my work I um, am been looking at places at the moments where um, two different where different cultures meet and fuse and a new kind of subculture is created and um, and what I did specifically in Dubai what I was looking for was these moments not just where alien sub alien cultures were recreated but what uh, what moment in this recreation um, was something totally new created? So in what sense is um, a, a cultural appropriation or the recreation, in what sense is an Irish pub in Dubai no longer an Irish pub but actually a completely new thing, uh, a new condition? Um, and in order to study these things, I've gone to um, places, um, I've lived and worked in places like Dubai that are hubs on the continent that kind of facilitate the global market economy. Um, Dubai is... Um, one such um, place because it's a place where um, Dubai Creek is one of the um, um, parts of the Middle East um, from which um, all the products um, are imported and then exported um, across the Middle East and Africa, um, mainly coming from China. 
Um, so anyway, so in these hubs and the ones that I've studied, uh, um, uh, the examples of the ones I've studied was Dubai in the UAE, Guangzhou in China, um, London, Houston, Lagos, and even Rotterdam as one search hub. Um, and so basically it's where um, the, the the finances and the products kind of flow through. So it's basically the hubs, the centers, which allow the um, global market economy to happen. And these places are um, interesting because they're cosmopolitan, but they're cosmopolitan out of necessity. So people meet, they work together, but they don't necessarily become friends or assimilate. Um, and anyway, so this, uh, the reason I've chosen this image is um, because I think that though there is, um, are very few elements um, to this image, they actually, the image actually describes the workings of the global market economy um, pretty much fully. Um, and I think firstly they describe the two, um, two economies um, that are propelling global um, capitalism. Um, one is obviously um, the movement of products and the creation of products which this ship um, is an example of um, represents and the other is um, tourism. So. Um, Dubai is a very important import-export hub. Um, as I said, goods come predominantly made from China. They're brought to Dubai, and then traders come from the rest of the world um, to buy wholesale from Dubai, and then they're loaded onto ships in Dubai Creek and kind of sent across the world. Um, what I, so I think this ship um, perfectly represents what we could call maybe the real of the global market economy. So it's the, the actual movement of actual things, it's, it's the stuff. Um, and then I think that this couple and um, of course this beach um, represent something else, um, which is um, tourism. And tourism potentially is the fantastical element of the um, market economy. Because tourism um, is, um, is, is the place where our fantasies and our dreams um, exist. Um, tourism is how we imagine the world. Um, and tourism is extremely important in Dubai. And I'm going to assume that these two people are tourists, or at least expats, um, not because I know their actual stories, but because I think with a, a, a nine to one um, ratio, I think it's pretty safe to assume. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, so basically, this is, um, I think these guys represent the kind of fantasy that the global market economy can um, provide us. And this is, an, um, this is also a kind of fantasy beach. If you can see over here, um, there's still some remains of the diggers that created this beach. And while I was um, in Dubai, it was amazing sensation, amazing because you could actually swim um, in a beach which was being created as you swam towards it. So they were putting sand and um, making it this kind of total um, idyllic, um, a, a kind of Thailand beach, totally artificially recreated um, in the Middle East. And then I think that this, so if we would say that the ships represent the real, the couple represents um, um, the fantasy, then this construction, um, to a certain extent, represents, um, is between the real and the virtual of the market economy. This is where the ambitions of the market economy happen. So we can see that very much in any city that is um, in, in development as going up, and, and Dubai in 2007 was a very good example of it, where it was just being built and the building was not necessarily out of necessity um, but what it was it was about it was a testament to the ambition it was about a statement about where things um, were going so it was a kind of between speculation it was investment which investment is necessarily between um, something between um, the real um, and the fantasy so I'm suggesting obviously because um, I'm suggesting that this image is an image from the future. Firstly, because of the artificiality of its landscape. Um, um, but secondly, also, because it takes place in Dubai. And I think that Dubai is a perfect example of authoritarian capitalism. 
So around the world we see the melding of capitalism with various forms of authoritarianism. We see this happening in the Middle East, we see this happening in China. And although capitalism has been said to be without ideology, um, we can see that there is a kind of creation of shared ideals. Um, when I was living in China and when I was traveling, um, I became very interested in this word lifestyle. And everyone, um, because a lifestyle was um, one of the only English words that appeared everywhere. So in every um, city had its own lifestyle magazine. Um, and clearly lifestyle is something which is a kind of uni universal. And I think lifestyle is as close as um, global capitalism comes to providing us with a coherent ideology. So the idea that you, know, you could arguably say that what these people are living is a lifestyle um, and that this beach is a kind of um, uh, is, is created is a lifestyle beach it's a kind of western import you can tell because of these towels you know this kind of a, a tanning and beach life um, is a daytime beach life is actually pretty alien um, to um, the Middle East um, and actually you would see usually that the Emiratis um, don't appear on the beach in the day but usually would appear in the night because the sun is so incredibly strong so actually Actually, um, the idea of like tanning, sit, sit, lying on a towel and tanning is pretty absurd because um, you risk um, third degree burns. Um, but anyway, so um, I would say that this is a future image, um, not only because of the artificial, artificiality of the landscape, which, which allows this kind of universal global lifestyle to, to play out, um, but I would also say that it's um, deeper than that because it um, represents uh, what um, the future of tolerance and multiculturalism might be. Um, and it's a, a version of tolerance that is emerging in places like Dubai, places like China, um, with a huge amount of um, foreigners. Foreigners um, living together in a kind of cosmopolitan um, apartheid. And in these environments, the pressure to understand each other in order to live together is removed. So it's no longer, tolerance and multiculturalism is no longer about inner, um, about inner life, um, which is a kind of like, maybe understanding, a need for understanding that can be easily read as patronizing. Um, and the question in this version of tolerance um, is not, is, is how can we be different to each other without understanding each other? Um, and um, I would say that the answer is not that we need understanding for this version of tolerance, but we need a new code of discretion. And I think that this couple is actually um, exhibiting this code of di ex uh, discretion. Um, because this code of discretion would be based on mutual disinterest, um, even ignoring each other. So in Dubai, there's a kind of equal inequality that happens. It's a kind of tolerance born out of alienation because no one belongs, no one um, can judge or point fingers. Um, I think that it's um, important to talk about my own identity um, when I'm reading this image um, because my identity is based very much in the old European version of tolerance. Um, I have a, come from a Dutch family. And um, the Netherlands is often um, um, very high, it is very high up in the political rankings of um, international civil liberties. The Hague is home to the inter International Criminal Court. Um, I think that Holland has been instrumental in creating a kind of um, a version, um, a, the definition of, of tolerance as we in the West understand it. And that was because in um, post war Holland, um, a landscape which was totally desecrated and impoverished. Um, so after the war, when the government attempted to um, come back and take power, um, the Dutch um, refused to let that happen. So what happened in the 50s and 60s there was a huge amount of um, political activity, um, political movements, protest movements, um, because as a reaction to, um, as a reaction to fem uh, fascism, 
the youth of Holland that wanted to create a new Holland which was based on, on egalitarianism. So these violent, um, there was sometimes a kind of violent um, revolution um, which created um, the laws um, that du Holland has been famous for, which is these kind of four um, runners of the kind of um, um, human rights. And so, for example, particularly um, with homosexuality and also with feminism, um, the Holland were very progressive in their, um, in their um, giving people, um, giving rights and giving women's rights and um, institutionalizing these into laws. Um, my grandmother was, um, on my mother's side, was a Dutch feminist called Harriet Fraser. And um, she um, was, had been a housewife who, um, after the war, had, um, who after the war had um, sort of changed her life and decided that she was going to be part of these movements and she had um, started writing on feminist issues. She became quite well known as a, a television and radio personality. And one of her main um, issues was obviously the sexuality of women and a women, woman's freedom to enjoy um, her body and sexuality. And um, one of the main, the main issues that they fought for was um, a woman's right um, to contraception and then also to abortion. And the idea being that um, when they were free um, to, um, when they had free access to these things, a woman would be able to enjoy her body for, um, uh, and her sexuality. So anyway, um, and so these, um, this battle led to the, um, sexual revolution, which was um, a, a big deal in Holland, um, and which out of which I was born indirectly, <laughs> and maybe some of you too. Um, <laughs> But I think that coming back, so I, but I never actually lived in Holland. Um, so this is part of my family history. This is something, um, the values that I very much identify with. Um, and, but I've only just um, started living in Holland four years ago. And I'm living in Rotterdam. And as we all know, this kind of model of tolerance is um, being eroded and um, is disintegrating. And, um, and so we are necessarily looking for new definitions or maybe just to tear down the old definitions, I'm not sure. But in any case, um, Rotterdam is an interesting case study for how um, Dutch tolerance has developed. So in the 80s and 90s, so currently in Rotterdam there are 175 different nationalities. In the 70s and 80s, um, there was a huge amount of money and investment and emphasis put into um, um, supporting different cultures. In the 90s, this changed um, and money was taken away from um, celebrating cultural diversity and put into focusing on poverty. And increasingly, the um, government's policies has been about um, forcing um, foreigners and newcomers to assimilate. Um, the emergence of the right-wing movement um, changed um, the political landscape considerably. Um, and so, I would say that maybe our old version, the version of my grandmother, um, fought for this, um, the idea of um, freedom and tolerance that she fought for is today um, threatened and potentially outdated. And I can see this particularly in the kind of way that feminist ideology is, is used and, and skewed, um, particularly um, in the argument um, on the war of terror. So we know that many um, feminists, um, many feminists and the feminist arguments were used um, um, in order to justify the war on terror in Afghanistan, um, and we can see that what has been happening, what from my pers what I can see happening now, particularly with the kind of um, feminist movement, is that women we are being asked to um, rather than looking inwards to our own um, culture, um, which obviously, of course, f feminists like Helen Hester do, um, but rather than tackling the corruption of feminist ideals and the new equalities that, inequalities that are emerged in recent years, I mean, we clearly still live in a patriotic, 
patriarchic society. There's a sexualized division of labor still predominates that relegates women to the sphere of family. Um, and if anything, sexual liberation, it could be argued that sexual liberation has um, left the burden of child rearing increasingly on women. Or that liberalism itself, in its opposition of private and public, actually harbors male dominance. But yet, our attention um, as Western women has been diverted to protecting it in a global sphere, protecting feminism in the face of multiculturalism. So you can see this very much with the discussions of feminists in France about the legality of the veil and headscarves. So the problem of tolerance is that it has become um, confused and it has become judgmental. Um, I'm going to now talk about um, Slavoj Žižek because I think it's impossible to talk about um, tolerance without mentioning his, his um, theories. Tolerance has said, uh, sorry, Žižek has said, why are t today so many problems perceived as problems of intolerance, not as problems of inequality, exploitation or injustice? He says that the culturalization of politics, political differences, differences conditioned by political inequality, economic exploitation are naturalized and neutralized into cultural differences, different ways of life which are something given, something that cannot be overcome but merely tolerated. So in his mind, tolerance, as it's used um, in the West, is a retreat from direct political solutions. Tolerance is a retreat from demand, like, for example, the demands of the civil rights movement. So he says, tolerance is a gift that we give each other, whereas rights are inalienable. And um, he quotes Martin, Martin Luther King to say, true peace is not just the absence of tensions, it's the presence of justice. So anyway, and he actually goes further to um, actually say that tolerance and intolerance are actually part of the same scale. He says that the moral majority fundamentalists and tolerant multiculturalists are two sides of the same coin. They both share a fascination with the other. In the moral majority, this fascination displays the envious hatred of the other's excessive jouissance, while the multiculturalist tolerance of the other's otherness is also more twisted than it may appear. It is sustained by the secret desire for the other to remain the other, not to become too much like us. Um, so if I would go back to the image, um, obviously I, um, or maybe not obviously, but I actually, as a result of my kind of Europeanness based in a kind of uh, Dutch um, feminist tradition, I identify most with this white woman. Um, and I identify with her because she is clearly trying to be as nude as legally possible um, in order to get a tan. And um, I, as an avid tanner, <laughs> I, I, I can connect with this. And obviously, but I also know the history of this. Um, this, this, this ta her tan um, traditionally in, in European tradition was a, um, a sign of wealth, a sign of per a person's mobility. A tanned woman in the 50s, 60s and 70s was someone who um, was um, emancipated and, um, and well-traveled and probably quite wealthy. Um, and um, and I, I can see that she's wearing a Brazilian bikini. And so, to a certain extent, by doing that, she, uh, she identifies herself with a kind of um, ideology of um, Brazilian, like, beaches. <laughs> there is an ideology. <laughs> um, I mean, at the same time, her boyfriend, I mean, I think, I, I, li I like her bikini, I like her tan, and I, I definitely identify with her, her desire to be in the sun, because I know, I am assuming that she's probably coming from quite a cold country, possibly even Holland, where she's sun-deprived and potentially vitamin D deficient. And this is a kind of temporary measure to, um, to deal with that problem. Her boyfriend, on the other hand, is slightly too tanned for my liking, and that's because we've moved beyond this 
this kind of um, the status symbol of tan, and um, the tan has now also become a sign of um, a kind of kitsch, um, potentially like w working class or unsophisticated um, connected to the spray tan. So we can see that Trump at the moment is getting a, like a, one of the main um, um, signs that we have for his, his, his lack of viability as president is his terrible tan and his bad orange hair. So anyway, this guy's looking a little orange, so I can probably therefore identify him as maybe a package tourist, um, someone who uh, I can identify them as people who are, since I know that Dubai is a very popular package tourist destination. Anyway, but I will take her nudity as a sign of her comfortability with her body and her sexuality. I identify it with a certain amount of freedom, a freedom that I myself experience and enjoy. Um, the, her Brazilian bikini is of course a nod to a, a, a even more sexualized culture and we're not going to get into the kind of post-colonial readings of this. Um, but anyway, um, so, but what I can say, what can, so now I will look at the um, woman and the couple, um, the other couple, the, the non-Western couple, although of course ultimately I'm assuming they're not Western, I'm going to assume this for this argument, but they could easily be um, English too. They could easily be, um, um, you know, they could also easily be expats who um, live in the same, they could be potentially live, working in the same place, um, living in the same building, and they could be neighbors. Um, but I know very little about this woman because I um, can't really see her. She's covered, she's hidden, um, and she remains mysterious. So how do I read her appearance from my Western feminist perspective? Um, and so, of course, I'll have to talk to you about the issue of her veil. The issue of her veil is, for me, of course, extremely problematic. Problematic because I am deeply invested in this idea that a woman's body should be freed. It should be... Um, it should not be um, considered um, a corrupting influence. It should not be considered um, something that needs to be hidden. Um, and yet, the discussion about the veil um, that's happening um, as part of our discussion about multiculturalism, about tolerance, particularly here in Holland, is something absolutely terrifying to me because it reveals how the ideals that my four um, sisters, my grandmother, fought for are being disintegrated. Because so much of what they um, were fighting for was to protect the women's right to um, do whatever she likes with her body. And obviously Obviously, um, that not just um, extends to what she would like to do sexually, but of course it extends um, naturally to anything that she would like to wear. So the fact that um, this um, mode of dress is actually illegal in France, um, made illegal here, and is, um, is actually a violation of, um, the, in my mind, the women's um, rights over their own bodies that my grandmother fought for and that I'm invested in. Um, anyway, so um, it's interesting for me um, that um, in a, in, a, in a moment when um, sexuality has become open to ex exploitation for almost um, everybody, um, we are actually, as women, refuse the final thing that we refuse is the right to privatize our own body and our right to hide. Therefore, I see the veil and the headscarf, and I see this very much happening in Rotterdam, as being transformed into a different symbol, potentially of a new feminist fight, um, and the fight to regain the rights over our body. Potentially, this veil is a radical um, feminist gesture. But other than the fact that they're wearing different styles of beachwear, I know very little about the difference between them. In fact, they're oddly synchronized. I would say there's almost an invisible mirror between them. And that lends this photo a kind of surreal quality. Um, and what's at the root of their synchronicity? As I said, they could be the same demographic. It's likely that they are um, newlyweds, honeymooners. Um, they could potentially have exactly the same lives, the same um, goals. Um, um, they could, you know, have the, exactly the same stories. And what is actually different is only the fashion. 
Um, but of course the difference in clothing style because there is so little on, in this image um, becomes pronounced. So what does this difference refer to? I mean we could say that all cultural differences refer to a different um, natural causes. So you could say that again this is, these are two um, reactions to um, different um, weather conditions in which um, they live. Um, but um, we can't look at this couple without acknowledging um, political theory um, as it exists in um, global capitalism. And, and I would like to um, talk about um, Samuel P. Huntington's um, book, The Clash of Civilization. So I know that you guys know, um, or know this book, but I'm going to um, just um, go over it a little bit um, anyway just to refresh your memories. Anyway, is that um, what, so you, um, Doug and um, Shimon talked about um, Fukuyama's end of history yesterday, which was the idea that basically um, we no longer had um, any ideology. And Samuel P. Huntington in 1992, in his lecture, said that this was, act, was a reaction exactly to um, Fukuyama's um, argument. He said that actually um, we were at a point, he said that claim that far from conflict being over, the end of ideology would mean that the things holding different people together would disappear and societies would splinter into different cultural groups. So as political metatexts disintegrate, cultural differences would become the thing people identify with most. So he said, um, in his view, cultural conflict would become the primary form of conflict. He said that after the end of the Cold War, the Iron Curtain of Ideology has re been replaced by the Velvet Curtain of Culture. So my question is, is this image evidence of this clash of civilizations that Huntington uh, had predicted? Um, certainly, Dubai is an example of how cultural groups stick together in a type of apartheid. Um, but is this apartheid necessarily conflict? Um, and this, I think, picture is kind of a good example of how having people with cultural differences in one frame can kind of um, suggest conflict um, when there is just simply a lack of uniformity. Um, but I think Huntington is a really good example of the danger of futurology. So Huntington um, potentially, he p predicted the clash of um, civilizations and if we look at the news we could certainly say that he has been right. Um, but yet Huntington potentially created the problem. He was not just a prophet but also a military strategist for the US. Um, during the Cold War the US had created an insanely powerful um, weapons industry that they wanted to capitalize on and the um, um, end of this um, ideological conflict meant they needed new sources of conflict and Huntington provided the rationale for this. His argument can be seen verbatim in the language of the war on, on George Bush's war on terror. Um, and ultimately his was a kind of argument for um, right-wing political views now um, like uh, tr um, that belonged to Trump uh, and, and um, and or many of the other Republicans, his argument ultimately was against integration and for cultural assimilation. Um, but something even more interesting, and I get this information based purely on an Al Jazeera documentary that I highly recommend, um, which was about how actually one of the biggest fans of Huntington's book was um, Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden read The Clash of Civilizations as a manual on understanding the ways in which the US would use culture in order to attack the Middle East and take their resources. He used Huntington's theories for evidence of the need to launch a preemptive jihad on America to goad them into acting on this um, clash of civilizations. So um, is his clash of concept of clash of civilizations real and has ideological conflict actually ended? Um, Zizek would say that actually ideology is more important than ever. Um, that politics, ideology and culture have actually merged into something seamless and that these distinctions no longer make sense. He says that 
what we have done now is describe things to cultural differences and therefore mask their political influences. Um, and he predicts that, in fact, um, what um, politicians are doing is they are fighting cultural wars while real big economic decisions are simply made by experts in shadows. That we are kind of returning to a pre-democratic time. In a sense, the majority can no longer be trusted. So, what does this image say about the future? At worst, um, if this actually is an image of our future, it's at worst it shows that we will live in an absolutely artificial future. We will live like this beach in a generic Disney-fied version of idyllic places which no longer exist, which are ultimately so predictable and unmysterious that they are mundane. Real nature will exist only in its true form as natural catastrophes like floods or hurricanes. In this new fake nature, this new fake nature is a sign of our complicated relationship to the environment because we think of our environment and as ecology as a kind of, in a fantastical kind of, um, it's a fantasy image um, that no longer connects to any reality. Um, an alternative, you know, to really love nature or to move away from these kind of artificial landscapes, we would have to start to um, embrace the garbage dumps um, or the corrupted nature, the reality of our world today. The we would have to visit plastic islands in the middle of the sea rather than um, fake Thailands in Dubai. Um, it would also potentially mean if this model of multiculturalism, this kind of ignoring this voluntary apartheid, um, becomes a dominant model, the new model, we would live in a world without understanding or communication, a world without cultural exchange. Um, this would mean that if an English person travels, they would stay um, in, an, in, an, in a Western um, uh, in Western travels, they would stay in Western hotels, eat in Western restaurants, go to Western style clubs, never actually um, interact with an alien culture. It means we would be highly mobile but not highly cultured and our prejudices would remain intact. But at best, this could be a hopeful image. An image, an instance of capitalism working at its best. In a week, we could see this as evidence that we are heading towards a world where capitalism has allowed us to maintain our cultural differences while managing to share a certain lifestyle. Um, a lifestyle being an environment without inherent culture. These people from different parts of the world are united um, united not in their cultures but in their willingness to travel in pursuit of money and their shared sense of alienation. This universal sense of alienation is useful because it negates our need for tolerance. Um, both the couple and the beach um, and probably this boat which is carrying um, fashions and, um, and products um, are, um, sh show a world which is defined by fashion. So you could say that it's an example of the commodification of everything um, from our belief systems to our contact with nature. We could say that in this world defined by fashion, religion becomes simply part of consumerist cons culture. The shock of cultural difference is absorbed by the cool of fashion. We could say that rather than being antagonistic, multiculturalism and identity politics fits perfectly with global capitalism. Global capitalism reinvents itself and thrives on the construction of differences which become niche markets. Um, Zizek, to return to him, would say that these outward signs of cultural differences masks, people, I, masks people's real ideological unfreedom. The fact that they can look or seem different masks the facts that consumer culture has actually um, homogenized culture, that there is no difference. Um, we have lost our real differences. So my question is, is the new multiculturalism going to be about fashion and its pseudo-political roots? 
Um, is this image a sign of the ultimate triumph of capitalism? Is this the end goal? Uh, are we trying to create a world um, which is full of places um, where cultures can be exploited and conflict can be sold to us um, and, and ultimately um, our statements about who we are um, um, simply um, reduced to fashion? Or are places like Dubai already relics of a different time, a pre-clash of civilization utopia which is being eradicated? And um, Dubai um, and China and all the countries that I was studying in 2007, 2008 are already closing their doors to foreigners. So in fact, um, potentially stages on which um, cultural differences can be performed, um, even if it's an empty performance are actually um, becoming um, inc increasingly hard to find. Um, but hopefully what I really would like to do, um, or what I think is necessary, is to counter the kind of negativity about multiculturalism and globalization that is happening at the moment, um, particularly from the kind of liberal West. I think um, Bernie Sanders' um, tirades and uh, uh, anger towards um, trade and towards China is a perfect example of how there are very few voices that are really um, 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 re um, really supporting uh, multiculturalism in an interesting way. Of course, um, we could say that global culture is drinking Starbucks and Zara clothing while working on Apple technology. And we could maybe lament the loss of a family-run business or, or well-made clothes or farmer's markets. We miss authenticity and we fear homogenization. Um, but this is itself a trap because this fear and this nostalgia ultimately gets us, um, allows us to be sold new things. But I would say that, um, you know, and in itself authenticity is a dangerous, um, a dangerous um, goal because of what Shizek has said, our multiculturalist perspective demands are maintaining difference and distinction in the name of authenticity. In the West, we want others to remain different because it provides us with authentic cultural experiences, our relief from Western culture. But anyway, I would say that um, whether this is a dystopian or utopian vision of the future, what is v very interesting is that um, this is happening and I would like to show what exactly happens after this moment. So you see that these people become momentarily entangled <laughs> and not exactly looking at each other, just looking sort of straight ahead. So if you see this guy, he didn't look anywhere, he just looked, his, his head's made at exactly the same angle and then they go and that's it it's that simple and it's um, it's 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 um, that easy and it's basically based on almost pretending that the other didn't exist and so that's my argument instead of a kind of global apocalypse a kind of um, um, conflict, um, um, a clash of civilizations. In the end, we will just become better at ignoring each other and potentially not seeing each other and therefore better at living together. Thank you. How are we doing with the energy level?